This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Hey, good morning. It is Deep South Dining. It's Monday morning. I'm Malcolm White. Carol Palmer is far, far away in Aspen, Colorado. Hello, Carol. Hello, Mal. I'm far away, but I can see you. Can you smell us? We're eating a lot of yummies here in the studio. I can't see Leanne, but I saw you with the plate. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to have at that plate. Also in the studio, while Carol is away, Leanne Galt. How are you, Leanne? I'm doing well. Good morning, y'all. Thanks for coming back. You were here last week, and uh, I convinced you to come on back and do it again. Come on back for condiments. That's right. So, Carol, tell us. What fabulous and cool stuff is going on out in the mile-high climates of Aspen, Colorado? Well, uh, I haven't been cooking so much as I have been eating. And I mentioned last week that most of us have never thought of Colorado as just a place where there are abundance of fruits and vegetables. But they have this area near Palisade, Colorado, and just the best peaches and tomatoes and cherries. But two of my favorite things that I've had out here involve kale. And one is a kale salad that this restaurant called the White House does with the peanut dressing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to bring this back. I found a recipe that They don't know exactly what's in it, but it's inspired by that recipe, and I am going to make some. It's delicious, and bring it in the studio next week. And the other thing, I'm going to get Leanne to work on this, is kale fried rice. Ooh, (laughs) kale fried rice. Sounds delicious. But I told you the other night, there were eight people, and, and we got three large oval platters of it to share. But Leanne, that sounds like your thing, something you can figure out. Taking notes. So what's going on in your kitchen now? Well, we had some interesting eats at the house this weekend. We, Kara made a corn salad, which was made from the corn you gave me, Carol. And the last of the Tommy Toe or Cherry Tomatoes, whatever you call the little ones, Mm -hmm. that David and Melissa Patterson furnished me with. So we had uh, corn salad as a side for, I don't know, four or five meals, which I enjoy. Kara also made an apple cake. She experimented on her recipe a little bit and made it a little drier than usual, but it was fantastic. So we also went out to dinner at Lynn and Elizabeth Stanga's house. Oh, they're nice. And Lynn is quite the chef. He prepared a shrimp and grits dish, which was his interpretation of shrimp and grits. It was mighty yummy. And so, Leanne, what's been going on in your kitchen this well, week? Well, I think I was invited to that dinner that you went to, but I had to work at the cooking school this ah. week. Well, I not had to. I was lucky enough to work at the Viking Cooking School this weekend. Well, tell us about your week at Viking. I know that you taught what a couple of classes. Two this classes. Week? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I taught a morning class, which was a pasta making class, and they made meatballs and pomodoro, and then Alfredo sauce and spinach stuffed ravioli. Ooh. And we made for them pistachio gelato and a salad. And then for dinner, it was French dinner party, and they made French onion soup and individual beef wellingtons, spinach souffles, and we made white chocolate mousse and raspberry coulis for them. And then when I got home yesterday, I hit all my grocery stores, and you have some on your plate, actually. This this plate that Java and I both, Carol, I'm sorry. (laughs) I know. I'm seeing the picture on Cooking and Coping on Facebook, and it looks grand. It was, but it was really hot yesterday, so I pulled out the Instapot. The Instapot? uh Uh-huh. So it was pressure cooker, soy braised pork belly. I see the pork belly. It's in a lettuce leaf, Carol, with a fabulous fiery red sauce. And what is the sauce? It's a gochujang sauce. Bim bim bap is a traditional Korean rice bowl. And the sauce that goes with it is gochujang, rice wine vinegar, a little sugar, a little mirin. So, Carol, in the third segment of our show today, we're going to let Leanne go deep on her trick bag of condiments, which she has brought us this morning. And she not only brought the condiments, she brought dishes 
that she used the condiments in. So in the third segment, we will go through each of those. And uh, if Java and I can keep from eating it all before we get to the third segment. What, I what, I what pork belly? That Java. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking, what pork belly are we talking about? I don't have any more on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do so the pork belly here. first? Well, me and Kevin were in here trying to figure out what exactly it was, and I knew it was some type of pork, but the sauce. Goju Jang. Goju Jang. Uh -huh. That is some awesome sauce. Now, uh, Java, awesome. you visited Mr. Chang's this week. You, you were telling us about that. You made your first trip into Mr. Chang's. Yeah, I made. I went over there to um, basically get some chopsticks. My daughter turned six over the weekend, and she is fascinated with Japan and sushi and all that kind of stuff. So I found some nice Mickey Mouse, believe it's a Mickey Mouse chopsticks in there, <laughs> and along with some other fabulous Asian things, but all of the fresh seafood that was literally floating around. <laughs> <laughs> in the store and all these kind of exotic things. It's, you know, when you venture out, it's amazing what you can find. Well, we've certainly heard a lot about Mr. Chen's Oriental Market on this show, and what oh. a great thing to have in Jackson. Yeah, Chen, not Chang. Sorry. Chen. Mm -hmm. I mispronounced the name of the yeah, store. I'm looking forward to the third segment because I, I really want to hear more about this gochujang sauce, this Korean sauce, so Leanne can certainly in lightness. Well, stay tuned, Carol, because that's what happens in the third segment. Right before we break, we've got a caller on the phone. We've got Sue, who has called in from Beaumont. Hello, Sue. Good morning. I'd like to ask a question, but it's not about condiments. I'm sorry. That's perfectly all right. We'll take any question that you have. Well, great, because I buy the greenest bananas I can find when I go to the store, so they will all get ripe so fast. But how do you keep bananas from getting ripe so fast? Because... No matter what I do, you know, within a few days, they're all ripe at once. But one time I bought some in green bananas, and I tied them up in a airtight plastic bag, and they didn't get ripe for quite a while. So hmm. but what, what's the secret? I mean, what can you do? If you put them in the refrigerator, their skin turns black. No, no, no. No, no Carol, Carol, <laughs> come forward here and yeah. help I don't us know, out. But there was even a song back in the 30s or 40s about never put bananas in the refrigerator. <laughs> I think Java could probably find it one of these days. So your question is how to keep them green. How do you keep them getting ripe so fast? Yeah, so when we buy them, we buy them in a bunch. And the truth is they all ripen exactly at the same time because they're all the same age. And she's asking if there's any way to slow that down so that they don't all ripen at the same time so you don't have a bunch of overripe bananas in your house well i'm actually looking at some it says six easy hacks to keep bananas from ripening too fast and the first thing to do is to hang them mm -hmm. and i'm sure you've seen those little wire or wooden hangers that actually hang the bananas you know from the top the bunch all together and to keep them away from other produce and another mm -hmm. thing you've probably seen this in the grocery store and thought it was a mistake is to wrap the stem of the banana in plastic. So those are two things that might help. Those are great tips, you know. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Sue, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for calling in and always uh, sharing a tip or having a question that keeps us up on our toes. All right, we're going to take our first break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about what we've been doing, but also we're going to have the one and only chef Taylor Bowen Ricketts on the phone of uh, Greenwood fame. You, Leanne? World fame, I think. World fame. World, <laughs> world famous. Uh, James Beard nominated. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackson, originally Jacksonian, now up in the Delta. Uh, has a great restaurant up there called Fan and Fanny Johnny's. Yes. Used to be called the Delta Bistro. Used to be called Delta but not Bistro. Anymore. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when we come back, Chef Taylor Bowen Ricketts will be with us. We'll continue to talk about condiments. We'll be right back. Start your week off right by listening to Monday's MPB local shows. Now you're talking with Marshall Ramsey has compelling stories from Mississippi. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit with family nurse practitioner Josie Bidwell rounds out our morning. If you miss a show, listen on MPB Think Radio's YouTube channel, on the MPB Public Media app, or our website, mpbonline.org slash radio. Welcome back. Deep South Dining. Malcolm White, Carol Palmer, Leanne Galt, 
Java Chapman, and a cast of thousands. <laughs> we are so happy to be here today. Carol, Carol, Carol. Can't wait to get Taylor, Taylor, Taylor on the phone. Let's see if we have the star herself. Not quite. She's not quite here. She's coming right around the bend. Of... Talk about condiments. Taylor Bowen Ricketts is a walking condiment fan. Yep, I learned most of what I know from her. Is she's, that right? Yeah, she's it's my mentor you know, for sure. Well, we can talk about her a little bit while she's not here. But I remember at a Southern Foodways Alliance, the great New York chef David Chang was one of the featured celebrity chefs. And he gifted Taylor with a large plastic bag of kimchi, the fermented, you know, Korean fermented and pickled okay. vegetables. Mm-hmm. And she literally cried. It brought tears to her eyes. I mean, he, he could have given her a diamond ring and she wouldn't have been as excited. So in Greenwood, we all enjoyed kimchi in many, many dishes for many, many months. And now she probably makes her own. I'm just guessing. Sure. Here. She does. All right, let's welcome to Deep South Dining the one and only Taylor Bowen Ricketts, the chef from and the owner operator of Fan and Johnny's. Good morning, Taylor. Hey, y'all. How's How in the world are you? I'm great. Loving having, getting to spend some time with y'all this morning. Well, let's talk about your operation. Tell our listeners a little bit about Fan and Johnny's and uh, the history and the menu and the foods and the concept of that remarkable restaurant. Well, here in Greenwood, right on Main Street, we have this little spot that is cozy and quaint and very... Fabulous. Unique, I would have to say. And we just do real food the real way with nothing fancy, really. We just use different ingredients to create very simple, tasty dishes. We can please just about anybody, which is something I've learned to do here in this town, which amazingly, for in the middle of nowhere in the Mississippi Delta, people come from all over. And so... You know, we can make just about anybody happy. We have something for everybody. I mean, of course, we're mostly Southern-oriented, but we have lots of global influences. I just am in the middle of making my special for today, which is going to be a little bit Southern, but a little bit Asian, I would say. I've got a almond shrimp angel hair with a tamari black sesame yeah. scallion sauce and... I'm really kind of into the textures uh, right now because, you know, it's hard to get good ingredients, and I don't like to use crappy ingredients. And I've found that even the simplest foods can make something really complex. And when you start adding textures to your flavors, I think it brought it to another level. My daughter, Sela, can't smell and she can't taste to, she says she can't taste, but I think she can some. And But she thinks it's been weakened because of her lack of smell, which apparently is a thing now with the COVID and the side effects. And so I'm yeah. trying to make food more exciting in different ways. And I'm bored, so I'm trying to <laughs> push all the limits. <laughs> but we have something for everybody we have a burger we have the best burger ever i think which is what it's called on the menu it's true it's all good it's all good <laughs> People come in here and ask me what to get and i said if that is on you <laughs> so we have a great team here and we also have a great space which i think in this day and age, people really pay attention to when they go out to eat because it's more than just the food. It's the atmosphere a lot of times, especially in this day and age when people are walking and running and going and trying to get to something and staring at their phones. It's nice to have a place to take a break sometimes from all that. And I think we've accomplished that as well as being able to feed your body too. Well, you're a painter as well, so I think your art is really important to the space and makes it feel... Uh, I wanted to comment. I mean, not only do you come from an amazing athletic family, and we didn't mention your dad, Bobo, when he was a legendary uh, Mississippi football player, but you come from a family of artists, too, and the art 
that's reflected on the walls gives that space, you know, an interesting, eclectic, and homey feeling. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. I think the homey, we try to make it very inviting and welcoming for everyone. And also, in a way, educational, because if anything, even if it's not the best art in the world, it's art. And that is something that's dying. You know, they don't teach it in a lot of schools anymore. It's not appreciated. And so hopefully we can throw that in there, too. Taylor, another comment you made, you said that your food is simple. And I would just like to say that it's anything but simple. It's very complex (laughs) and layered. And when I think of your food, the word big flavors comes to mind. Because everything you do has a punch, a big flavor. Well, let me tell you this. (laughs) I went to the banquet Saturday night, and I was betting a hundred bucks that it was going to be chicken, and it was. And (laughs) we, uh, (laughs) it also there were also some carrots with it, and they were nice carrots because they were, you know, the the multicolored, so they weren't just your run of the mill carrot. But it just went awry somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it was just a, a roasted carrot. And, of course, everybody at the table was waiting for me to come back from the bar to because <laughs> the, the food had been served, and they were waiting to hear what I thought. And, you know, it was fine. We were all hungry, and it was a banquet, and that wasn't what, what we were there for. And, dear Lord, the challenge of trying to feed 650 people at one time, at, I mean, that's just what I'm guessing. It could have been more, is a nightmare. So that's not what we were there for. But, of course, I came bebopping back to Greenwood, and what did I have last night? Roasted carrots. So <laughs> I put all kinds of other stuff on them and it was just seasonings and spices and and it was the same carrot type situation but spices um but you tailorized it yeah yeah can just make such a difference and you know not only that is i mean if we can manipulate a simple vegetable like that we can all eat a lot healthier because the flavors are there and then it gives you the exciting feeling that you get when you are eating a chili cheese coney from Sonic. <laughs> and, but you don't feel bad afterwards. Right. You know? <laughs> All right, yeah. we've got uh, we've got a caller. Allison is on the phone from Madison and we'd like to see what she's up to. Hello Allison, what you got? Hey Malcolm. Look, I want to thank y'all. It's Allison Balducci. Uh, thank y'all for highlighting areas in Mississippi for road trips. I met my family in Shelby um, yesterday, and in route we were listening to an encore presentation. So you know where we ended up for lunch. Uh, Stafford's on Mary. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And the fried chicken was absolutely unbelievable. I don't know how they get that batter so crispy, but Mel, the lady that, that was the server, you would think it was her place. She just took such pride in it, and I just want to thank y'all and um, li- look forward to listening and having more adventures in our great state. Thank you, Allison. Thanks for listening. You know, we not only are live on Mondays, but we also rebroadcast every Sunday at 9 a.m. for those of you who can't catch us live, and then you can always podcast us. We are perpetually available to be podcasted. Well, speaking of fried chicken, before we go, uh, Taylor, how do you fry chicken, and what is your take on the great southern yard bird meal? Well, let me tell you what. We sell chicken lots of different ways, and, of course, fried is one of them. But on our menu, we do Nashville hot chicken, right? probably, and, you know, then we do a salad with it as well, but we use the, it's more of a Louisiana hot chicken po' boy, but I've got some Nashville connections, and so I nodded to them, right. and it's delicious. We sell it a lot, all day. I mean, people love chicken. I think I've got my friend Webster, who works with me back here in the kitchen, is the best. 
at making fried chicken, he, and it's not just me, I'm just not just saying that, everybody says that, and it's just a simple process as well, but it's the pepper. We use mm. one drug, and he seasons it perfectly with salt and pepper only, nothing else, nothing else. and butter, and we dip it in buttermilk as well, so... I think... Do you dip it, but not soak it? We dip it, not soak it, and then we dredge it in the seasoned flour. Some people brine their chicken. I do not. Do we you? do brine it, but we usually brine it like if we are roasting it or mm. smoking it or something else. We don't brine the fried chicken because we just don't do a whole lot of bone-in chicken and stuff. It fried, that is. Mm-hmm. Leanne, what's your take on the fried yard bird? Well, the way my mom did it, so the way I do it, is to brine it in buttermilk and hot sauce and salt and pepper. Just and overnight? Overnight, mm-hmm. and then flour with lots of salt and lots and lots of pepper, and fry it 350-degree oil, like seven minutes aside or whatever, however long it takes. But my grandmother, my mean grandmother from Kosciuszko, she was the best fried chicken. She was the best at fried chicken. And my cousin and I were going back and forth on Facebook the other day because I said, I wish I could make Mama's fried chicken and chocolate pie. And he said, I don't know how she did it in the back kitchen. And I said, well, I think meanness was the secret ingredient. But she made some fine chicken. Do you know anything about how she made it? I don't think she browned it. I mean, you know, I don't think it was buttermilk or anything. I think she uh-huh. just floured it, it and fried skillet it. Or a, skillet or a Dutch oven? Mm-hmm. Skillet. Taylor, talk to us about using Wondra as opposed to just a regular all-purpose flour. Well, I think that what we've noticed is if we're ever out and we've had to go supplement with all-purpose, it's almost like Wondra is more of a, it stays individual, each little pellet of microscopic flour, whatever it is, stays separate. It doesn't clump as much, Mm. and it's just a softer coating, maybe, on the product. I feel like maybe it has a little cornstarch in it. Well, it's not cornstarch, but it's it's just the texture of the grind, I think. And I don't think it's cornstarch, or I I don't think so. We'll figure it it, out. It acts like it is. Yeah. Uh Ah, it's impersonating cornstarch. Well, I'm looking. I'm looking here. I just quickly look it up. It says it's a kind of pre-cooked wheat flour made from wheat and malted barley, and then mm. it's very finely ground. Uh, uh-huh. It dissolves more quickly than all-purpose flours. And um, there's also a recommendation. It says it's great for creamy soups, thick stews, gravies because it doesn't clump. See, yeah, Chef Doesn't Taylor clump. said it wouldn't clump. She yeah. was right. Yeah. I, I can't wait to try it. No, so I, I recommend it highly. We don't use anything else. And if you try to do the thing that you should never do, which is thicken something with flour with no anything mixed into it after a, you make a soup or a sauce, you know, you're going to get the clumps. Right. But where's the lumps in my gravy? But if you toss a little bit of wonder in there, it does blend right in, hmm. which is kind of a magic trick, I think. So there's a magic trick from Chef Taylor Bowen Ricketts <laughs> at, at Fan and Johnny's and, and Green, which she's a magician. She's a swimmer. Uh-huh. She's a chef. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Taylor, we're gonna we're gonna let you get back to your uh, preparing of the lunch special today, and we want to thank you very much for joining us this morning. And remind our listeners, if you want your socks blown off, you will stop in Fan and Johnny's in downtown Greenwood, Mississippi, for lunch or dinner. What are your hours of operation before you go, Taylor? All right. Well, we have lunch eleven to two Monday through Friday, and we have dinner. From six to nine Wednesday through Friday. So do come your, see us. Yeah, do yourself a favor and go to Fan and Johnny's and uh, ask for Chef Taylor Bowen Ricketts. She'll be in the kitchen yeah. every time you go in. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. All right. See, see you. Love you. Bye. Bye, Taylor. <laughs> All right. Gonna take bye. a short break, and we'll come back. Leanne is going to take the take the floor and introduce this plate of food. 
that uh, I'm still looking at. I'm pretty sure uh, that Java's eaten every bit of his. He may have already eaten the plate. I don't know. <laughs> we're going to talk about condiments. We're going to talk about this food that Leanne brought us, and we're going to take your call. I see, Mike, you're on the phone. Hang on, man. We'll be right back with more Deep South Dining. Some people can love them one at a time. For every woman there is a man. My baby says she wasn't put here forever. So she gonna love as many as she can. But what can I do? Connect with the people looking to connect with you. Become an underwriter with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. For more information, go to mpbonline.org slash more slash underwriting. Welcome back, Deep South Dining. Malcolm White, Leanne Gall, Carol Palmer, Java Chapman, and a cast of thousands. And on the phone, one of our thousands, Mike is calling from Hernando. Hello, Mike. Hey, you guys. Let me press question by telling you that I in television news for 20 years. I've lived all over the United States and know places to eat in several states. But I'm from Mississippi, I've lived here. But when I get to some small towns or some areas where I'm unfamiliar, it's a coin flip as to where to eat. And somebody, maybe this exists, would publish a guide to the food route, like you guys said, just with your previous guest, Taylor. I didn't know that place existed. I would certainly stop there and have a meal. Is there any guide published, or has anybody thought of putting one together? That's a great question, Carol. There's a a book by a wonderful food writer, Susan Puckett, and it is called Eat, Drink, Delta. So, you know, I know that we have that whole area, but it was a, you know, nationally published cookbook, and it's very well researched. It's been a few years since it's been out. So, yeah, things could have changed, but it is a wonderful, wonderful guide. That's uh, nice. If you know what town you're going through, a lot of times, I know for Greenwood, their CVB. Yeah, Convention has, and Visitors Bureau Has a websites. great listing of all the restaurants and what they are. So most towns, I think, have that. And I don't know about Mississippi <clears throat> Tourism. Do they have a? Well, at one point, Mississippi Tourism published a, a guide of off the beaten track kind of eateries but i think the thing about something like this mike is that the day you write it it's obsolete the day you write it places close and open so unfortunately the internet is probably the best guide because it is more contemporary and it's you know but now i do not know of a website that is thorough complete uh, for what you're looking for but i think maybe it's a project for someone whether it's a, a podcast or a website but the idea of publishing a book. Follow waiting, Stafford Sheridan. <laughs> yeah, Stafford certainly would know. But anyway, it's a great question. You know, we're glad that you're out there writing and eating and telling the Mississippi story. Thanks so much for listening and calling. We appreciate it, and I think that's a good project for someone like Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, please go on the Southern Foodways Alliance website and look up the Tamale Trail. I mean, that's very specific. But if you're going through small towns, that is just a a great guide. All right. As promised, Leanne is going to talk to us about her trick bag of spices and herbs and condiments. And Leanne, explain to us what Java and I have. Carol doesn't have this because she's in Aspen, Colorado. But in front of Java and I, there is this plate. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah. So I wanted to give you the pure condiments to mm. try, but also I wanted to use them in food so you could get an idea of how they work. So just looking at your plate from here, you have fresh nectarines with chili crisp on it. We talked about <coughs> chili crisp last yes. week. It is a Chinese condiment that is, it's fried chilies, so they're crispy in oil. And this one, which is Lao Gan Ma, which is kind of the most popular one, I think, has garlic and crunchy soybeans in it. I also like David Chang's. We're talking about him again because he's the cutest man ever. But he put Szechuan chilies in his, so it's a little numbing. It's a, a something called a mala, M-A-L-A. Mala. It's the sensation of numbing your mouth mm. with Szechuan chili. And then to the next to that, you have crispy chickpeas that I tossed in harissa. They're fried. They're fried. Mm-hmm. And then you have levna, which is which I'm chewing on now. Which is a strained yogurt, mm-hmm. not strained like my bank account, but strained you know, through, 
something and still it's the consistency of soft cheese. And to that, I added cucumber and mint and dill and preserved lemon. Mm, the preserved lemon is part of your trick bag, isn't it? Yep, and mm-hmm. gave you some little pita chips to eat it with. Mm-hmm. And then but there's yeah, what's left. Tell the listeners what harissa is. Um, harissa is a hot chili pepper paste that's native to the Maghreb area, which is Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia. And they grind it together and make a paste out of it. Sometimes you can find it in a powdered form, and it's not uncommon for it to have rose added to it. Hmm. And it's, it's delicious. It's kind of fiery. Um, and yes. then you have my leftovers from dinner last night, which was a pressure cooker soy braised pork belly lettuce wrap with um, sauce. It's a hot sauce. It's um, a hot sauce. The, it's uh, gochujang. Yeah, the which, gochujang. So gochujang is a spicy Korean condiment. It's a paste. It's made with gochuru, which is red chili flakes, dried chili that they have, glutinous rice, and fermented soybean powder, as well as barley malt powder, which oddly was in Wondra. And it's Mm. kind of sweet and savory and spicy. And with that, I mixed it with rice wine vinegar, sugar, some mirin, and some garlic to drizzle on top of that pork to kind of cut the richness of the fatty meat. Next comes the watermelon that has a nice hot Top. Watermelon with um, tajin, which is a, a chili lime salt from Mexico, Latin America. And finally, in the center of the plate, <gasps> oh, there's forgot. the beloved deviled eggs, but they are, they're the, um, they're good. They're the yuzu kosho, <laughs> yuzu kosho ah. um, deviled eggs. So it's yuzu kosho paste, which is Thai chilies and fermented yuzu juice and peel and some other things thrown in there. So it's spicy and citrusy. We talked about it last week. And then there's some chopped cornichon and shallot in there as well and radish on top. It's fabulous. I love a deviled egg. You said you did. Leanne, a lot of the condiments that you've talked about, you know, we heard the word chili a lot. And those of us out in Radio Land who aren't lucky enough to be eating this plate, I just wanted you to comment because even though you're using the word these are chili products, They are all very, very different, and each dish is distinct. It's not over chili. No, I hope not. I guess Malcolm will have to tell you because he's eaten our java. I'm overjoyed, but not over chili. (laughs) Yeah, like the chili crisp, Taylor and I both share a common love for texture, and it's very crispy and savory, but it balances the sweetness of the fruit really nicely, but it's not overly hot. I mean, you can get it super spicy, but this one is not. And I mean, chili crisp, right now there's like a TikTok craze. Chinese teens are putting it on the kind with Szechuan pepper, the really spicy numbing one. They put it on soft serve vanilla ice cream. Mm -hmm. And so it's become a TikTok phenomenon. But I didn't have any soft serve vanilla ice cream, so you got it on nectarines. You know, Lynn made a dessert the other night that was ice cream with some salt and some olive oil Ooh, on yum. the top of the vanilla ice cream. And that, that was a nice touch and a different sort of way to use a salty, sweet, it was creamy with the uh, olive oil. And Leanne, I can appreciate the chilies for a person who does not like hot food. My wife says she's making me turn a corner, but I'm not turning fast enough um, <laughs> for her cooking. But this is nice as far as, like you said, it adds kind of a little spice, a little kick but it's more texture, and it's good, especially for, like I say, a, a non-spicy, hot food eater like myself. So, Leanne, this plate, you have just the spices and the tricks, we'll mm-hmm. call them. So if you would talk about each one of those, and I know that they were all used in the yep, final so- product that Java and I are consuming as we speak, but talk a little bit about the, so the, the condiments. The green one that looks a little like wasabi paste, that's yeah, the sort of, Yuzu yeah. Kosho, April McGregor posted on Facebook last week that that was her secret ingredient of choice as well. I remember. And like I said, it's it's yuzu, which is an Asian citrus fruit, and which is grape flavor similar to lemon, lime, and grapefruit. It's really good. And you can use yuzu koshu. It's spicy and it's citrusy, and you can make vinaigrettes out of it. I used it. I mixed it with kewpie mayonnaise, a non-spicy, a non-chili-based Asian condiment, and used that in the deviled eggs. And then the gochiru is, you know, like I said, sweet and salty and spicy and savory all at the same time. And I kind of balance that with some sugar and acid because it can get kind of spicy. The chili crisp, we've talked about Chinese crunchy texture. I mean, it's all over 
cooking and coping. If you search for chili crisp in the group, it you'll have like the group loves a it. thousand posts come up. And then the tahini, which is the salt, the chili lime salt. Wow. You know, um, cooking and coping yesterday, there was a dish by Brannon Aiden, doctor in Jackson, and she cooked a Calabrian chili glazed meatloaf. And I think that sauce would be found in the Italian section, but it just looked beautiful. It was pretty. Yeah. And we want to shout out to our cooking and coping family. Thanks for always being there and furnishing us with great ideas and great inspiration. And I want to thank Leanne for co-creating that phenomenon. It's all your fault. <laughs> not all my fault. You and Carol. It sure is fun. Yeah, I get so many ideas. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a person who just, you know, these tastes just don't pop into my head like they do Leanne's. But it's really changed my cooking, especially on the condiment side. I think the generosity of the people on the page is so awesome as well. You know, like Bob Yarborough will post this gorgeous picture of something that he's just made on the fly, homemade bread with homemade preserves and, you know, bacon that he slaughtered in his backyard or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it's gorgeous. And then he'll share the recipe that he worked from in the comments so that everybody can give it a try. You know, nobody's too precious to hold on to their recipes and not share. Everybody seems to share. And, Carol, I don't know if you know this or not, but the day after tomorrow, the 3rd, is National Watermelon Day. So it's Oh, my goodness. you, you got to get, get some tahine. If you haven't got I'll be home just in time. And speaking of condiments, on the 6th, it's National Mustard Day, which is a great condiment. A great condiment. Leanne, do you embrace the mustard in, in oh. how many ways? <laughs> I love the mustard. I, um, actually, there's, in the deviled eggs, there's a little of that Chinese mustard powder mm. in there, too, just to... Jazz it up a little bit. Um, now, let me ask this question. Does mustard go in a potato salad? It certainly yes. does in mine. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because we ran up on this uh, last Saturday where you could go to Kroger's and they had two kinds. And, uh-huh. I, and I could not remember... Should I get the one with the mustard or without the mustard? I couldn't. I just couldn't remember at the at that moment in time. <laughs> with the mustard. Yeah, it's different strokes for different folks. You know, some people love the mustard in a deviled egg. Some people love the mustard in a egg salad. Some people love the mustard in a potato salad, and some don't. Some just don't even like the mustard. Yeah, my brother and my stepbrother didn't like. Please don't add the mustard. Please don't. Add if the I mustard. want mustard, I'll add it myself. But I think mustard is one of the like. There's sort of a chili shortage, and so Sriracha, the company that makes Sriracha, is going to discontinue making Sriracha, or they announced that they were going to, and there Mm. has been kind of a shortage of mustard on the shelves, too. Oh, no. Well, there's a proliferation of mayonnaise out there. There Thank goodness. (laughs) Carol, once again, out in Aspen, what's your favorite thing you have encountered out there, your favorite food, favorite meal, favorite dish? Well, I guess... Last night I had a shortcake made with the palco peaches. And with the peaches. So simple, so delicious. Yeah. Mm. Well, we're so happy uh, that you got away to the cooler climbs of uh, Aspen. We look forward to your return next Monday to be here in the studio with Java and with me. And we uh, look forward to that. Have a safe return home. Leanne, thank you so much for being here the last two Mondays, the last two sessions. It's been a delight. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is cool. All right. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio, and we are funded by the generous contributions from the good people who listen to our show. We are produced by Java Chapman. For my co-host, Carol Palmer, special guest, Leanne Galt, And Chef Taylor Bowen Ricketts, I'm Malcolm White, and please join us every Monday for more Deep South Dining, heard exclusively on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org.